Thank you, Jesus. So it's just rolling around the inside of me. Be still. And know that I am God.
it would seem that an excessive dose of his power is what's necessary. And that's what he's giving you. Cast all of your care over onto him. For he knows what you have need of before you ask. Do not fret or be anxious about anything, but in all things through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Make your petitions known to God. Hallelujah. Be confident of this. When you speak to your Heavenly Father, He hears you. But be equally confident of this. He hears you and He answers you. And the answer, according to His holy written word, praying the promises of God, the answer is yes, and amen. So be it, or it is so. Why not just take a hold of the greater one? Cast all your care over onto him. Yeah, some of you just need to let that balloon go. All the cares, all the worries, all the stress. Some of you just need to let it go. And do this. Be still. Know that He is God. He is awesome. sang it this morning he is awesome there's nothing too difficult for him there's nothing impossible to him there's nothing incurable to him he can handle all of it and the truth be told he already has You just have to be a good child. What do I mean by that? Just go into the refrigerator and take out what you need. Come on. Can you see yourself in your little feety pajamas? Walking up to God's refrigerator? Because it's yours. It's His. Opening up the door. And taking out what you need. Jesus has already paid for it. Some of you just need to get a hold of this peace that's in here. I mean, I got heat flowing all the way up to my knees. Whoo! Why? Standing in the presence. He's here. Oh, I got a witness. He's here. He's here. And sometimes when he shows up, you just got to get quiet enough to receive from him. But Lord, how am I going to? Shh. Got you. But what if? Shh. I'll help you. Well, what happened? It's going to be all right. I've got a good plan for your life. It's a plan with a hope and a future. A plan to prosper you and not to harm you. A plan that will give you a certain end. Whoo! Hallelujah. I'm glad I came. Well, go ahead and say hello to somebody. Speak blessing over them.
Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Praise God forever. What you encountered this morning and what you're still encountering should be the norm in your life. Look at that, the peace of God even invaded my office. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. So over the course of the next month, as you're, some are fasting and some are praying and seeking God's direction for 24, you probably should have started already. I started in October. Aren't you glad? Don't want to show up unprepared, amen. I know what's going to happen in 24. Just like I knew what was going to happen in 23. Amen. I spoke to my Heavenly Father. And by His Spirit, He showed me things to come. Amen. So 2024, I know what's going to happen. It's not going to be more of the same. So it's not going to be more of the same. The church, the ecclesia, the called out ones, those who will listen, those who will do, will see more of the glory of God in 24 than they've ever seen before. You'll see more of it. You'll see greater demonstrations of it. Amen. Amen. We were here two or three Thursdays ago, and I spent the last 15 or 20 minutes we were here prophesying what was going to happen in 24. We wrote it down. You should have been here. You would know. <laughs> Hallelujah. They're like, well, is he going to tell us? <laughs> of course. <laughs> You're part of the body of Christ. Amen. If you call Faith Bible Church your home church, you should know our marching orders. I say you should know our marching orders. Amen. That's why we get together at least once a week to pray. Well, we're going to give you opportunity in January to come out every night. Amen. We'll give you opportunity to come out every night. Not to check a box, not to give you something more to do, right? Because too many Far too many Christians don't do what you just encountered. Standing and being still in the presence of God and teaching your mind, shut up. Focus on Him. Amen? Amen. Now, as is the case with every year, some are going to get it and some aren't. Right, And we have those that tune in, they watch us from all over the world, and some are going to get it and some aren't. How come? Well, because some won't engage. Right? God has already done His part, now you and I, we have to do our part. Amen? Hallelujah. And so I had uh, one word came up in my spirit in October, expectation. And I was like, all right, well, I can work with that. And then it seemed, as I was going along, more expectation. Well, all right, I, I can work with more expectation too. But what I need is I need a definition of expectation. A strong belief that something will happen or be the case in the future. Expectation also means remarkable uncommon and rare expectation is confident that god is able to do what he said he would do expectation and hope then are intertwined this way hope adds the element of being joyous or joyful and so as i was chewing on that i began to get around joyful expectation 
And I began to get around that, and I began to start chewing on unexpected expectation. And of course, you know that old cliche, expect the unexpected. You say, well, how can you expect the unexpected? Unless you're expecting. Oh, let me try that again. How can you expect the unexpected unless you're expecting? And we just saw last week that Mary, when she heard from Gabriel that she was going to be overshadowed by the Holy Spirit, and she was going to give birth to something holy, I began to see a clearer picture of a body of believers that would allow the Holy Spirit to come and impregnate them with the Word of God. And they would begin to be expecting. Expecting what? Well, if you're pregnant with a baby, what are you expecting? A baby. If you're impregnated with healing, what are you expecting? If you're impregnated with prosperity, what are you expecting? If you're, ex- if you're impregnated with deliverance, what are you expecting? And if you're impregnated with restoration, what are you expecting? And he said, I'll restore to you the years that the canker worm and the chewing locust have stolen. And your barns will be filled to overflowing. And your vats will be overflowing with wine. When the Holy Spirit is poured out on all flesh. That's this dispensation, isn't it? The Holy Spirit has been shed abroad. He has come back from heaven. He's returned to the earth. And He gave birth to the church. So I put two words down. Maximum expectation. My daughter, who turns phrases much better than I, says it like this. 2024, expecting more. What are you expecting are you expecting to spend the next 365 days just traveling around the sun grinding it out going through life the same old way or are you willing to do what's necessary to come up higher well what does that mean does it mean i got to do more stuff i think that the adversary has done a really good job of making the body of christ as busy as he possibly can. So busy that we don't have time for the things of God. And what we do for God now becomes another thing to do. I'd like to remind you of Matthew 6 and 33, which says this, Seek, thank you somebody, Seek first the kingdom of God. Then all these things will be added unto you. Is that what the Bible declares? Well, you have to back up for context. You have to go up into verse 30 to see the context. He says, don't be like the Gentiles who chase after homes. Come on, clothes and food. Your father knows. Come on, somebody. Don't override the scripture. Don't rush past it. He knows what you need. He knows. You know what's lacking? We don't expect God to move on our behalf. We know that God knows what we need. Do you know God will meet all of your needs? According to His riches and glory in Christ Jesus? Right? The Apostle Paul wrote it like this. He said, I know in whom I have believed. He came past believing and started knowing who his God is. And so it is the number one need in the church today. You've heard me say that over the course of this last quarter. Why? 
because this is what the Holy Spirit is showing me. We'll read the Word of God, but we don't expect it to come to pass. We'll study the Word of God, but we don't expect God to move. Meanwhile, you've got more than enough in you right now without listening to one more sermon. Come on! Without studying one more Bible study, one more book, one more tape, one more CD, one more YouTube video, you've got more than enough in you right now to affect all the change that is necessary in the earth. Right, you heard me uh, talking during announcements. We had uh, former Governor Rowland here on, on Friday, and so he asked me a question afterwards. He says, I asked this of all pastors. So, okay. He says, uh, has the church turned over its responsibilities to the government? I said, you need to come to Faith Bible Church. I said, we have been teaching for over a decade that the body of Christ goes around demanding its rights without accepting its responsibilities. We have taken what it is that uh, the church is supposed to do. You know, take care of the weak, take care of the infirm, take care of the orphanage or orphans, take care of the widow. We've turned that, take care of the needy, take care of the, we've turned that over to government and then complain about the way that they do it. And meanwhile, God is saying, you're the ones that are supposed to do it. Hello? So back in 1800, in the 1800s, there was a man by the name of George Muller in uh, England, I believe it was. And he had a, a, a call on his life. He had a passion for orphans. And it's still standing today. He built a massive orphanage. Right? I mean, he had to believe God for every brick. Why? Because he didn't have any money. And this is the issue in the Western church. We keep looking at the bank account. Come on. Am I talking to anybody just yet? Yeah. Haven't even gotten into my notes. <laughs> right? We keep looking at the bank account and saying, I don't have enough. Let me help you. If you're going to do anything for God, your bank account is always going to be too small. You are always going to be in the red. Faith Bible Church, this building is paid for. Woo! Glory. I mean, it's paid off. We own it. But the vision is always in the red. The vision is never in the black. Why? I'm always going to be tasked by God to do more than what I can do in the natural. I can't look at my bank account and say, okay, God, we got this. Because my bank account will not purchase the 50 acres of land that we're going to purchase. My bank account will not build the buildings that we're going to build. My bank account, come on somebody, will not hook up with tunnels to towers and have them build their facility on our property. And we'll get those homeless vets off the streets. Are you listening to me? My, my bank account will not have a GED program in it. It won't have computer program in it. It won't have interviewing skills in it. It won't have resume building skills in it. Are you listening to me? If I look at my bank account, I say there's something wrong with the movie. I need much more. What am I expecting? <laughs> Glory to God. I'm happy I came. Yeah. Yeah. So if expectation and hope are intertwined and hope adds the element of being joyful or joyous, then I should be pretty happy. Come on, in my expectations. So should you. And maybe, just maybe, the church goes around with this trout pout on because we're not expecting anything. Did you come this morning expecting, right? Because, listen to me, listen, listen, I want you to pay attention. Somebody say, I'm listening. The move of God we had this morning 
is because you came expecting him to show up. And we don't tell him how to show up. Sometimes he shows up running. Sometimes he shows up laughing. Sometimes he shows up dancing. Sometimes he shows up crying. Sometimes he just shows up and there's a stillness and you go, oh, I am in his presence. And even right now, his glory is falling on me. <laughs> and here's what happens when his glory falls on me. <laughs> it begins to wash over onto people. <laughs> And I get close to them, and all of a sudden they just start, I don't know why, but they just start. <laughs> this is what, <laughs> woo, <laughs> woo. <laughs> it just starts to wash over onto people. Maybe if we were expecting God, who's in us, to heal people when we walk by them. What? That's crazy talk. Did Jesus do it? Did Peter do it? I think that Peter became a really good example for us because, you know, the Bible says he cussed. That has everybody in this room covered. <laughs> Come on. He used a rough and ready fisherman. What? Yeah. What happened? Peter got so a hold of who God is and who he is in God, come on, that before, no glory to God, he ascended into heaven, his shadow was healing people. Now we keep picturing a physical shadow, but I had a minister talk to me about this. It was over lunch one day and it made perfect sense to me. She said this, she said, how big is a shadow? And I said, I don't know, three, four, five feet. It really depends on your relationship to the sun. So it would seem that if I have more of a relationship with the sun, the longer. Which means that as I walk by people, they could be within three feet, they could be in within five feet, they could be within ten feet. The glory of God that is resident, that is on my life, can wash over onto you. You say, Pastor, do you expect that? Every day. Every day. When I shake hands with somebody, I'm expecting them to be instantly healed. I'm expecting it. How about you? Right? We See, the church doesn't think like this, but we're about to. Why? Because we're going to put it in you. We're going to put it in Why? Because God needs you where he has called you. Right? I, I hear too many Christians, they're, they're trying to quit their job and go do something for the ministry. I want to go do something for the Lord. I'm going to quit my job. No, no, no. The reason he gave you that job is so that you could do something for him right, right there. Right there on that job. Right there. You've heard me say this. Right there on the 14th floor. Right? As you're walking by and your coworker's going, <coughs> and in the name of Jesus. Are you listening? Hallelujah. So I'm expecting something. You know, Daniel chapter... I think it's over here in chapter 11, in verse 32, says, But the people, somebody say, I'm listening, who know their God shall prove themselves strong and stand firm and do exploits for God. There's a whole bunch in here. Stand firm and do exploits. Well, what does that mean? Why do I have to stand firm? It tells me you're going to be opposed. There's an adversary out there who's going to oppose you. And there's going to be a thought process. It's the thought process of the world. That's crazy talk. That, come on. That, that, that's crazy. You really do, you do you believe that you could point to a, you, 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 you're going to point to a tree like Jesus did and it's not going to produce, that's crazy. You're going to speak to wind. You're going to speak to waves. That's crazy. See, you started pulling back on me. You're going to speak to cancer, and it's going to leave somebody's body? You're going to speak to AIDS and lupus and mental oppression, and it's going to leave their body? Come on. Come on. I got three head shakes now. And four amens. 
right? I don't need a crowd. But what are you expecting? Stand firm. 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 Don't move. Firm. Stand firm. And set your expectations in God and His Word as high as you can set them. Uh, listen, I can get three weeks ahead of myself and say, now unto him who's done exceedingly abundantly. Abu-. Let's not get there just yet. We're just putting down a foundation for you to launch 2024 off of. Right? The Apostle Paul said it like this. Forgetting those things which are behind, I press on into the high calling. What's the high calling? Expand the kingdom. Expand, expand the kingdom. Bring the kingdom of God wherever it is you go. Right? Right? Is the kingdom of God in you? Then wherever you go, the kingdom of God goes. Right? How do I know this? Well, Jesus taught his disciples to pray, Our Father who is in heaven, holy is your name, your kingdom. Well, if the kingdom of God was already here in the earth, why would he say pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven? The Bible is very clear. There's no sickness in heaven. The Bible is very clear there's no poverty in heaven. The Bible is very clear there's no mental oppression in heaven. The Bible is very clear. He says, bring that to the earth. And here's how you do it. I've given you my name, that authority. Use my name and speak to that symptom and tell it to leave. How many were healed in 2023? Come on. Look around the room. (laughs) Glory to God. Where the enemy came along with a symptom, a problem, a challenge, and God healed it. Glory. Praise God forever. Yeah. So if you'll stand firm, not looking right or looking left, but your gaze fixed on the author and the finisher of our faith, for the extraordinary to come to pass, then the extraordinary will become the norm in your life it is a supernatural life there is a natural world that we live in elohim created it he is the creator elohim is how god introduced himself in the beginning elohim he is the creator of natural law and everything that you see around you. And then he changes his name in Genesis 1 and verse 22 or around 22. He said, now let us create man in our image. He changes his name to Jehovah Elohim. And Jehovah always has a connotation of blood, which means that there's going to have to be blood shed in order for this to come to pass. Speaking of his son. Hallelujah. Right, but you'll remember the story that was recorded uh, uh, on Abraham and Sarah where he couldn't get her pregnant when she was 18. Couldn't get her pregnant at 30. Come on, couldn't get her pregnant at 55. (laughs) Couldn't get her pregnant at 80. (laughs) And then finally, she's 90, he's 100. It's impossible. Somebody say impossible. In the natural. It's impossible. And he changes his name. Abraham starts calling him El Shaddai. The all-sufficient one. The one who can supersede natural law. Come on. God created the law. And he can supersede it. You're not hearing me. Uh, let me mess with you. In the, Old Te- in the Old Testament, I'm sorry, in the New Testament, there are on um, at least two occasions where a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ was translated from one place to another place. What? Yeah. Right? We saw it with, with, uh, with Philip and the Ethiopian. <laughs> And by the way, did you ever notice this in the scriptures? The Bible says that Philip was running next to his chariot. Philip was running as fast as a horse. 
Selah. <laughs> Went from where he was to where the Ethiopian was in a millisecond and was running as fast as the horse. <laughs> How do I know this? Because the eunuch looked out the window of his little thingy and saw him running next. <laughs> the Bible said running, didn't say walking. You're not, you're, uh, some of you are going to say, what? You say we can be translated? Sure. Sure, sure. It's super natural. It's an interruption in the ordinary. I know of a minister who was ministering in Oklahoma and was driving with his wife and his two uh, children coming back from Oklahoma to Texas and they hit something in the road and it put a hole in their gas tank. Some of you have heard me share this story. It's an actual event. He recorded it, put it down in words. And so as there, I mean, if you've ever been on those roads, uh, Cindy and I have been on some of those roads, uh, there, there's nothing <laughs> between Oklahoma and Texas <laughs> except the road. <laughs> and it wasn't too long before they ran out of gas. And now on the side of the road, it's like 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. They're just stuck there. And they, so he gets everybody out of the car, and his little girl said, Daddy, what should we do? And he says, let's pray. So they prayed and they thanked God for the help that they need to arrive. And it went too much longer. All of a sudden, here comes this headlights. And it pulls up to them and it's a tow truck. Two, three o'clock in the morning on this road. <laughs> Hooks the car up. Takes it off. I don't know. It was, I think it was the next exit or the exit after that. It doesn't matter. Got off the exit. There was an old greasy spoon diner that was closed and a gas station next to it. Right, brought the car into the station, put uh, when it went in, opened up the office, turned on all the lights, opened up the door. They they pushed the car in onto a lift, and uh, the 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 guy started working on the the tank. Sure enough, there was there was a hole in the tank, and so he fixed the tank for them. And then they pushed the car out, and they brought it over to the pump, and they filled the car up with gas, and he took his wife and his babies home. And about a month or so later, he was driving back up to Oklahoma. And uh, the guy, the guy would not take any money, just kept saying to him, listen, I was sent for such a time as this. I was sent for this. Don't worry about it. I was sent for this. Don't worry about it. Right. So he knows how to be blessed. And so anyways, about a month later or so, he was back up in Oklahoma and uh, he was driving back down and he saw the exit. And he said, well, I'm going to go thank that guy, buy him lunch, give him something nice. And so uh, gets off the, uh, the highway and uh, pulls into the gas station and there's like padlocks on the gas tanks and he goes up to the office door and he's looking in and it's dark and it's dirty and it doesn't look like anybody's been in there in forever so he goes to the greasy spoon next door and he says uh, hey listen he says um, I had some trouble here a little while back and the guy next door in the garage helped me out he said there doesn't look like there's anybody there and the, the owner of the diner said there's been nobody there for years He says, really? He goes, yeah. He said, uh, okay, thank you very much. Got back in his car and started driving. He had an encounter with an angel. <laughs> Did you know that angels could turn on to power where there is no power? <laughs> Did you know that angels could weld a gas tank? <laughs> Did you know that angels can make gasoline come out of a gas pump that has a padlock on it? Are you listening to me? What am I talking to you about, church? A supernatural encounter. What are you expecting? Pastor, you don't understand. It's been this way for years. What are you expecting? Are you expecting more in 24? Or just the status quo? Amen? Hallelujah. Psalm 23, verses 5 and 6. You all know it says, you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup runs over. Surely, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Are you expecting goodness and mercy to follow you all the days of your life? God has extraordinary gifts on this table that's in front of you. And the adversary keeps hitting you on the side saying, hey, 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 trying to distract you from what's on the table in front of you. I've got a word of the Lord for you. 
turn around. Turn around. Some of you have been listening to him. Somebody, you've been pulled off your path listening to the, you've been pulled, you're looking at wind, you're looking at wave, you've gotten off of what it is that God, turn around and look at the table that he has prepared for you. Everything you need is in and in front of you. Not but there's a reason why they have a windshield and a rear view mirror. <laughs> We're trying to do this. <laughs> you cannot drive the vehicle of your life forward looking in the rear view mirror. Amen. Your best days are in front of you. We, I, you know, we, I, I, the Israelites give us an a, 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 a insight into this, into the human psyche that you can so conveniently forget how difficult it was. There, wasn't there enough leeks and enough garlic back in Egypt? <laughs> wasn't there enough graves that were out here in the West? They were looking at slavery where they were being abused day in and day out. Come on. Seven days a week. And somehow, some way, they're out in the wilderness for eight minutes and forgot all about it. Come on. If you're the righteousness of God, I'm just listening on the inside because there's a million ways you can go here. If you're the righteousness of God in Christ, and you are, then you've been set free. Jesus has opened the cell doors. And the body is what the Holy Spirit is showing me. And the body of Christ is still sitting in the cell. We're free. We're free from sickness. We're free from disease. We're free from poverty and lack. We're free from the adversary. We're free from them. It's much safer in my little cell. I'm comfortable here. It's amazing to me how comfortable we can get. Do you know why? Lack of vision. Abram was in his tent when the Lord appeared to him and said, you're going to be the father of many nations. And he's like, listen, I've been trying to get this woman pregnant. I'm doing 2023 version, right? I've been trying to get her pregnant now for decades. Either she's dead or I'm dead, but something, there's just something missing here. And God says, Come outside the tent. You're going to get that when you're driving home. Come outside the tent. See, when you're in the tent, the enemy loves to cover. His nature is to cover, right? He covered the throne of God with praise. He covered the throne of God with music. He has a covering nature. The Bible says it like this in the New Testament, that he blinds the eyes by covering us with darkness. And here's what God says, and here's your word. You ready? Come outside. Get out of the tent. You can't see past the walls of the tent. Takes him outside and says, look up. I do feel like preaching. I'm trying not to. <laughs> he says, look up. Count the number of stars in the sky. Your descendants is going to be more than that. Look at all the sand on the seashore. Your descendants are going to be more than the number of grains of sand on the seashore. God changed his vision by bringing him outside of his tent. I would like to say it to you like this. God changes vision when you get out of yourself. As long as you're looking at yourself, you're going to be limited. As long as you're looking at yourself, you're going to be frustrated. As long as you're looking at what you don't have and what you should have and who did it to you, you're never going to get where you're supposed to go with God. Right. Amen. You're going to have to get over yourself. 
So you're going to have to get over yourself. 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 Did you know that yourself can put you under? Yourself can say, listen, I hope he wraps up soon. Because <laughs> it is, after all, noontime and it is, you know, New Year's Eve. And we got the seven fish thing going on today and we got... <laughs> We got to go visit family. We got to go visit friends. Right? Somebody say self. self. Yeah. Self right now wants a sandwich. <laughs> Come on. Big meatball sandwich with cheese on it. Right. Yeah. Self. self. Did you ever, we talked about this in the last series on being fruitful. When you start getting antsy, come on. It's time to engage perseverance and patience. Come on. And this is what we're talking about through faith and patience. They obtained the promises of God. God is promising us something here in 24. If you'll expect more from me, it'll come to pass. If you'll begin to engage with me more, you'll get more. And the more of me you'll get, then the less this will seem to be so important. Or you can frustrate yourself. Burn yourself out and burn yourself up trying to get what it is that God's already provided for you. Oh, that's deep. How many people are so stressed out, so anxious, so depressed, so worried, so overwrought because they go through their lives trying to do what God has already done for them, trying to get what God has already given them, and they're trying to do it themselves, and they have burned themselves out as a result. They quit marriages. They quit jobs. Talking about the body of Christ now. I'm not talking about the world. The world's going to do what the world's going to do. I'm talking about the body of Christ. Come on, they quit their kids. They qu- they quit. What what? I, I listen. I tried that. I tried fixing it. We did. We did. I mean, it was week after week, month after year after year. Been out there grinding. I've been trying to get it done. Yep, that's the issue. Your answer was found this morning. So I I didn't plan this morning. I didn't sit in my office this morning while I was praying for you and saying, "Okay, Lord." I'd like to show up and have so much peace be in the room that nobody can speak. (laughs) Let's do that today. That'll show them. (laughs) Right? He gave you an illustrated sermon this morning that I have just spent the last 40 minutes trying to explain. He gave you what you need. Why don't you take 15 or 20 minutes a day Before your day starts, get out of yourself, get into his presence, just sit there. What? That's weird. (laughs) Listen, just so you know, right, Cindy and I went through some great challenges in 23. Physical challenges, mental challenges, we went through some great challenges in 23. And when I began getting this, I say, well, sitting down in a chair and doing nothing, I'm not reading, I'm not praying, I'm not listening to worship, I'm not listening to a message, I'm just sitting here. Lord, it's the weirdest thing ever. Because myself didn't want to do it. And what I found out is that the master distractor, he showed me this this morning while we were worshiping, Right, the master distractor so fills up the human soul with garbage that you couldn't hear the Holy Spirit if he landed on your head in Irish clogs and started dancing a jig. <laughs> Come on. Brother Hagen used to say the church, the, the, you know, the, the Christian, you know, wouldn't know the Holy Spirit if he jumped up in front of him with a red hat on. <laughs> right? The Holy Spirit is always going to lead you to peace. 
be still. I'm going to unhook, but be still and know I'm God. Can you take some more? Because <laughs> there's like four pages up there. I haven't touched them yet. <laughs> Lorraine is like, no! <laughs> this is going to be like a four-parter. But 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 I, I think I th- I think I think we're supposed to get here. So in Exodus, I think it's in thirty three. Yeah, in Exodus thirty three. Stay with me. You've been listen. You've been excellent. You have, but I think that. Another part of the reason that God showed up the way He showed up this morning is to subdue your flesh. Because you need to hear this. So in Exodus 33, God is talking with Moses. Now if God can speak to Moses in full sentences under the Old Covenant and in the Old Testament, how much more should we be hearing from God in the New Covenant with the Holy Spirit living on the inside of us? It shouldn't be a strain, it shouldn't be a stretch, it's easy. We have to work on becoming better spirits. It's easy to get over into the spirit, right? So here he is, he's, God is talking to Moses. He said, yeah, you're all going into the promised land. He said, I'm not going to go with you. I'm going to send an angel in front of you. Somebody say, I'm listening. And he's going to drive out the Hivites and the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the termites and all those other rites. Going to drive them all out from in front of you. Now that could be a word of the Lord for you, Right? That you have so much clutter in your life that God has sent an angel this morning to start clearing the clutter out of your life so that you can go possess the land of promises, which first of all is a land of peace. A land flowing with milk and honey. It's got more than enough provision in it. Everything you need is in that land. But we've managed to stack all this clutter or allow the enemy to put all this clutter on our lives and we can't see the promised land anymore. It seems like a distant dream. Are you listening to me? He says, I'm not going to go with you because they're a stubborn, (laughs) stiff-necked people. (laughs) And I'm going to consume them. (laughs) I said, this is God talking. He says, well, you're going to go. And I love Moses. He says, listen, if we go without you, number one, I'm not going without you. And number two, how will everybody know that you're with us if you don't go with us? And God, in essence, says, and I'm giving you Reader's Digest here, because of you, I'll go with you. I'll go with you. Somebody needs to get a hold of that. Going into 2024, you're not going in alone. God says, I'll go with you. I'll send an angel in front of you to clear all this nonsense out of the way, and I will go with you. And it was so overwhelming to Moses. I need you to put yourself in the scripture. It's so overwhelming to Moses that Moses, I think it came out like this. Show me your glory. I think he was just so overwhelmed at the goodness of God. Come on. that that Show me your glory. God says, well, no one can see my face and live. And I always rush through this scripture. Let me just pull the covers off myself. Began chewing on this. And I saw two things. He says, go stand on the rock. Go stand on Christ Jesus. On Christ the solid rock, I stand. He says, go stand on the rock. And I will cause my goodness and my glory to pass by you. But I will put you In the cleft of the rock. There's two things there, church. I'm going to give them to you just so. Just Behold, here it is, Exodus 33 and verse 21. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me where you stand on the rock. Somebody say, By God, I stand on the rock. (laughs) By God, I stand on the rock. 
Yeah, by God, I stand on the rock. Yeah, and then he says, Behold, there's a, yeah, the whole, and, and I'll, while my glory passes by, I will put you. There's two different actions here. Go stand. I love that. By God, go stand. Woo! Glory. But when my glory is passing by, I will put you in the cleft. So I started taking a look at cleft. It's the past participle of the word cleave. And a cleft in a rock is a seam or a split. So I'm going to put you in Christ. Come on. You're going to be in Him. He's going to be in you. I'm the vine. You're the branches. <laughs> He's the vine. Come on, somebody. You see it? It all started flowing together for me. Now I'm in Him. But when my glory passes by, I'm going to cover you with my hand. And I was like, okay, wait there. listen, Lord. I don't, there's, there's something wrong. Why would you cover me up from your glory? You ready to shout? You ready to scream? You ready to dance? I want to give you so much of my glory that unless I put my hand over you, you'll be translated right off the planet, right into heaven. So what I'm doing is I'm protecting you from all of my glory. I'm going to give you as much glory as you can handle without getting off the planet. Are you listening to me, church? He wants to give us so much glory, so much power, so much demonstration that we'll be miniature Enoch's, mini Jesus's, Christian, little Christ's, walking on the planet, filled with so much glory that one more step, we're going to heaven. <laughs> he said, but no, 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 I need you here. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm to I'm gonna give you everything that you'll take, everything that you'll hand, as much of my glory as you can bear. And it's easy. You need to stay with this. It's easy. The man who trained me for ministry would say things like, the glory of the Lord would come so strong on me that it felt like electricity running up and down my body for hours sometimes after meetings. The glory of the Lord so coming on him so strong that it would cause his watches to stop. Are you listening to me? That's the level of glory. I said, that's the level of glory. If we'll yield. Documented, Smith Wigglesworth sitting on a train, a Catholic priest walks by him and falls down before him and says, man, what is it about you that convicts me of my sin? It was just so much glory on him and so much glory in him. Are you listening to me, church? Right? He was, is a true story. Uh, he was ministering, uh, it was somewhere in England because he was English. He was from York, England. He was wherever he was. And there was a woman in the church, and she asked the pastor if Wigglesworth would could come because that, that's how they did it back then. There was no Motel Six or, you know, Garden Inn or. Are you with me? You, the minister would come stay at your house, and so she asked the pastor, "Could he come stay at my house?" And she had a motive because her husband was a terrible drunk. And abusive, and all those things. And so the uh, pastor agreed, and so uh, she put Wigglesworth up while he was there, and uh, he slept in their bed, and they slept in, in the guest room or whatever. But they gave him, gave him the big room. And after uh, the meeting, and I don't know how long the meeting was, day, two, three days, whatever, he's leaving. But the husband didn't show up to any of the meetings. The husband didn't get born again. And he's more abusive now than he was before. <laughs> uh, he's, just a, he's a miserable jerk. And so Wigglesworth is getting ready to leave. He's walking down the little path going to his carriage. And, you know, she, she cries out, but Brother Wigglesworth, my husband hasn't gotten saved yet. And he gets to the gate, and he opens up the gate, and he turns around, and he slams the gate shut. He says, sleep in my sheets. What? Yeah, don't wash the sheets. Sleep in the sheets. Sounds a little weird, doesn't it? So the husband comes home from the pub. They climb into bed, and he... Tossing and he's turning and 
he can't get it. She's like, what is the matter with you? He goes, man, he says, my legs are on fire. I don't know what he says. My, my legs are just, they're burning. And, and then he's tossing and he's turning. He said, what is the matter? He said, my whole body feels like it's on fire. I think I'm dying and going to hell. And she says, so you want to get born again? He says, yeah. And he got born again. Because of the anointing that had gotten into the sheets. Every Sunday, somebody say, I'm listening. My team and I are praying. And this room fills with God's glory. And we ask His glory to invade the cushions and the curtains and the carpeting. So that when you're walking in here, you're walking on the glory. When you walk in here, you're walking in the glory. The glory. When you're sitting in here, you're sitting in the glory. And God promised me I would see tongues of fire on individuals' heads. I'm seeing the glory. Are you listening to me? God is showing up in a greater and greater measure, and He's saying, I'm going with you into 2024. I'm sending an angel in front of you. He's clearing the way. But here's the key. Somebody say, I'm listening. You got to get over yourself. You put His things first. And everything else you need, everything that you've been striving for, everything, he said the Gentiles do that. That's, that's people that have no relationship with God. They strive for all these things. And here you are, the ecclesia, stressed out, burned out, worried, filled with fear, anxiety. Come on. It's not supposed to be part of our lives. I said it's not supposed to be part of our lives. Amen. He said, expect more in 2024. Maximum expectation. Amen? Amen? Stand to your feet, everybody. Father, thank you for your holy word. I thank you that as we go into a new year, there's a new beginning. But Father, we purpose now to be those that push aside the busyness of life to turn around to the table that you've prepared for us. And to partake of everything that you've placed on that table. All the peace, all the joy, all the healing, all the prosperity, all the deliverance, all the mercy, all the grace, all the forgiveness. Everything we need is on the table. We choose to be partakers of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah.